Section one of Beacon Lights of History, Volume nine European Statesmen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by K. Hand. Beacon Lights of History, Volume nine European Statesmen by John Lord. Mirabeau, Part one a d seventeen forty nine to seventeen ninety one the french revolution three events of preeminent importance have occurred in our modern times these are the protestant reformation the american war of independence and the french revolution the most complicated and varied of these great movements is the french revolution on which thousands of volumes have been written so that it is impossible even to classify the leading events and the ever-changing features of that rapid and exciting movement the first act of that great drama was the attempt of reformers and patriots to destroy feudalism with its privileges and distinctions and injustices by unscrupulous and wild legislation and to give a new constitution to the state the best representative of this movement was mirabeau and i accordingly select him as the subject of this lecture i cannot describe the violence and anarchy which succeeded the reign of terror ending in a directory and the usurpation of napoleon the subject is so vast that i must confine myself to a single point in which however i would unfold the principles of the reformers and the logical results to which their principles led the remote causes of the french revolution i have already glanced at in a previous lecture the most obvious of these doubtless was the misgovernment which began with louis the fourteenth and continued so disgracefully under louis the fifteenth which destroyed all reverence for the throne even loyalty itself the chief support of the monarchy the next most powerful influence that created revolution was feudalism which ground down the people by unequal laws and irritated them by the haughtiness insolence and heartlessness of the aristocracy and thus destroyed all respect for them ending in bitter animosities closely connected with these two gigantic evils was the excessive taxation which oppressed the nation and made it discontented and rebellious the fourth most prominent cause of agitation was the writings of infidel philosophers and economists whose unsound and sophistical theories held out fallacious hopes and undermined those sentiments by which all governments and institutions are preserved these will be incidentally presented as thereby we shall be able to trace the career of the remarkable man who controlled the national assembly and who applied the torch to the edifice whose horrid and fearful fires he would afterwards have suppressed it is easy to destroy it is difficult to reconstruct nor is there any human force which can arrest a national conflagration once it is kindled only on its ashes can a new structure arise and this only after long and laborious efforts and humiliating disappointments it might have been possible for the government to contend successfully with the various elements of discontent among the people intoxicated with those abstract theories of rights which rousseau had so eloquently defended if it had possessed a strong head and the sinews of war but louis the sixteenth a modest timid temperate moral young man of twenty-three by the death of his father and elder brothers had succeeded to the throne of his dissolute grandfather at just the wrong time he was a gentleman but no ruler he had no personal power and the powers of his kingdom had been dissipated by his reckless predecessors not only was the army demoralized and inclined to fraternize with the people but there was no money to pay the troops or provide for the ordinary expenses of the court there was an alarming annual deficit and the finances were utterly disordered successive ministers had exhausted all ordinary resources and the most ingenious forms of taxation they made promises and resorted to every kind of expediency which had only a temporary effect the primal evils remained the national treasury was empty calon and necker pursued each a different policy and with the same results the extravagance of the one and the economy of the other were alike fatal nobody would make sacrifices in a great national exigency 
the nobles and the clergy adhered tenaciously to their privileges and the court would curtail none of its unnecessary expenses things went on from bad to worse and the financiers were filled with alarm national bankruptcy stared everybody in the face if the king had been a richelieu he would have dealt summarily with the nobles and rebellious mobs he would have called to his aid the talents of the nation appealed to its patriotism compelled the court to make sacrifices and prevented the printing and circulation of seditious pamphlets the government should have allied itself with the people granted their requests and marched to victory under the name of patriotism but louis the sixteenth was weak irresolute vacillating and uncertain he was a worthy sort of man with good intentions and without the vices of his predecessors but he was surrounded with incompetent ministers and bad advisers who distrusted the people and had no sympathy with their wrongs he would have made concessions if his ministers had advised him he was not ambitious nor unpatriotic he simply did not know what to do in his perplexity he called together the principal heads of the nobility some hundred and twenty great seigneurs called the notables but this assembly was dissolved without accomplishing anything it was full of jealousies and evinced no patriotism it would not part with its privileges or usurpations it was at this crisis that mirabeau first appeared upon the stage as a pamphleteer writing bitter and envenomed attacks on the government and exposing with scorching and unsparing sarcasms the evils of the day especially in the department of finance he laid bare to the eyes of the nation the sores of the body politic the accumulated evils of centuries he exposed all the shams and lies to which ministers had resorted he was terrible in the fierceness and eloquence of his assaults and in the lucidity of his statements without being learned he contrived to make use of the learning of others and made it burn with the brilliancy of his powerful and original genius everybody read his various essays and tracts and was filled with admiration but his moral character was bad was even execrable and notoriously outrageous he was kind-hearted and generous made friends and used them no woman it is said could resist his marvelous fascination all the more remarkable since his face was as ugly as that of wilkes and was marked by the smallpox the excesses of his private life and his ungovernable passions made him distrusted by the court and the government he was both hated and admired Mirabeau belonged to a noble family of very high rank in Provence of Italian descent. His father, Marquis Mirabeau, was a man of liberal sentiments, not unknown to literary fame by his treatises on political economy, but was eccentric and violent. Although his oldest son, Count Mirabeau, the subject of this lecture, was precocious intellectually and very bright so that the father was proud of him, he was yet so ungovernable and violent in his temper and got into so many disgraceful scrapes that the marquis was compelled to discipline him severely all to no purpose inasmuch as he was injudicious in his treatment and ultimately cruel he procured lettres de cachet from the king and shut up his disobedient and debauched son in various state prisons but the count generally contrived to escape only to get into fresh difficulties so that he became a wanderer and an exile compelled to support himself by his pen mirabeau was in berlin in a sort of semi-diplomatic position when the assembly of notables was convened his keen prescience and profound sagacity induced him to return to his distracted country where he knew his services would soon be required though debauched extravagant and unscrupulous he was not unpatriotic he had an intense hatred of feudalism and saw in its varied inequalities the chief source of the national calamities his detestation of feudal injustices was intensified by his personal sufferings in the various castles where he had been confined by arbitrary power at this period the whole tendency of his writings was toward the destruction of the ancien regime he breathed defiance scorn and hatred against the very class to which he belonged he was a cataline an aristocratic demagogue revolutionary in his spirit and aims so that he was mistrusted feared and detested by the ruling powers and by the aristocracy generally while he was admired and flattered by the people who were tolerant of his vices and imperious temper 
on the wretched failure of the assembly of the notables the prime minister necker advised the king to assemble the states general the three orders of the state the nobles the clergy and a representation of the people it seemed to the government impossible to proceed longer amid universal distress and hopeless financial embarrassment without the aid and advice of this body which had not been summoned for one hundred and fifty years it became of course an object of ambition to count mirabeau to have a seat in this illustrious assembly to secure this he renounced his rank became a plebeian solicited the votes of the people and was selected a deputy both from marseilles and Ai. he chose Ai, and his great career began with the meeting of the states general at versailles the fifth of may seventeen eighty nine it was composed of three hundred nobles three hundred priests and six hundred deputies of the third estate twelve hundred in all it is generally conceded that these representatives of the three orders were on the whole a very respectable body of men patriotic and incorruptible but utterly deficient in political experience and in powers of debate the deputies were largely composed of country lawyers honest but as conceited as they were inexperienced the vanity of frenchmen is so inordinate that nearly every man in the assembly felt quite competent to govern the nation or frame a constitution enthusiasm and hope animated the whole assembly and everybody saw in this state's general the inauguration of a glorious future one of the most brilliant and impressive chapters in carlyle's french revolution that great prose poem is devoted to the procession of the three orders from the church of st louis to the church of notre dame to celebrate the mass parts of which i quote shouts render the air one shout at which grecian birds might drop dead it is indeed a stately solemn sight the elected of france and then the court of france they are marshalled and march there all in prescribed place and costume our commons in plain black mantle and white cravat noblesse in gold worked bright dyed cloaks of velvet resplendent rustling with laces waving with plumes the clergy in rocher albe and other clerical insignia lastly the king himself and household in their brightest blaze of pomp their brightest and final one which of the six hundred individuals in plain white cravats that have come up to regenerate france might one guess would become their king for a king or leader they as all bodies of men must have he with the thick locks will it be through whose shaggy beetle brows and rough hewn seamed carbuncled face there look natural ugliness smallpox incontinence bankruptcy and burning fire of genius it is gabriel honore riquetti de mirabeau man ruling deputy of a yes that is the type frenchman of this epoch as voltaire was of the last he is french in his aspirations acquisitions in his virtues and vices mark him well the national assembly were all different without that one nay he might say with old despot the national assembly i am that now if mirabeau is the greatest of these six hundred who may be the meanest shall we say that anxious slight ineffectual looking man under thirty in spectacles his eyes troubled careful with upturned face snuffing dimly the uncertain future time complexion of a multiplex atrabilious color the final shade of which may be pale sea green that greenish colored individual is an advocate of arras his name is maximilian robespierre between which extremes of grandest and meanest so many grand and mean roll on towards their several destinies in that procession there is experienced mounier whose presidential parliamentary experience the stream of things shall soon leave stranded a petion has left his gown and briefs at chartres for the stormier sort of pleading a protestant clerical saint etienne a slender young eloquent and vehement barnave will help to regenerate france and then there is worthy dr guillotin bailey likewise time-honored historian of astronomy and the abbe saez cold but elastic wiry instinct with the pride of logic passionless or with but one passion that of self-conceit 
this is the saye who shall be system builder constitutional builder general and build constitutions which shall unfortunately fall before we get the scaffolding away among the nobles are liancourt and la rochefoucauld and pious lally and lafayette whom mirabeau calls grandison cromwell and the viscount mirabeau called barrel mirabeau on account of his rotundity and the quantity of strong liquor he contains among the clergy is the abbe maury who does not want for audacity and the cure gregoire who shall be a bishop and talleyrand paracord his reverence of autun with sardonic grimness a man living in falsehood and on falsehood yet not wholly a false man so in stately procession the elected of france pass on some to honor others to dishonor not a few towards massacre confusion emigration and desperation for several weeks this famous states-general remain inactive unable to agree whether they shall deliberate in a single hall or in three separate chambers the deputies of course wish to deliberate in a single chamber since they equal in number both the clergy and nobles and some few nobles had joined them and more than a hundred of the clergy but a large majority of both the clergy and the noblesse insist with pertinacity on the three separate chambers since united they would neutralize the third estate if the deputies prevailed they would inaugurate reforms to which the other orders would never consent long did these different bodies of the states general deliberate and stormy were the debates the nobles showed themselves haughty and dogmatical the deputies showed themselves aggressive and revolutionary the king and the ministers looked on with impatience and disgust but were irresolute had the king been a cromwell or a napoleon he would have dissolved the assemblies but he was timid and hesitating necker the prime minister was for compromise he would accept reforms but only in a constitutional way the knot was at last cut by the abbe saez a political priest and one of the deputies for paris the finest intellect in the body next to mirabeau and at first more influential than he since the count was generally distrusted on account of his vices nor had he as yet exhibited his great powers saez said for the deputies alone we represent ninety six per cent of the whole nation the people is sovereign we therefore as its representatives constitute ourselves a national assembly his motion was passed by acclamation on june seventeenth and the third estate assumed the right to act for france in a legal and constitutional point of view this was a usurpation if ever there was one it was says von seibel the able german historian of the french revolution a declaration of open war between arbitrary principles and existing rights it was as if the house of representatives in the united states or the house of commons in england should declare themselves the representatives of the nation ignoring the senate or the house of lords its logical sequence was revolution the prodigious importance of this step cannot be overrated it transferred the powers of the monarchy to the third estate it would logically lead to other usurpations the subversion of the throne and the utter destruction of feudalism for this last was the aim of the reformers mirabeau himself at first shrank from this violent measure but finally adopted it he detested feudalism and the privileges of the clergy he wanted radical reforms but would have preferred to gain them in a constitutional way like pym in the english revolution but if reforms could not be gained constitutionally then he would accept revolution as the lesser evil constitutionally radical reforms were hopeless the ministers and the king doubtless would have made some concessions but not enough to satisfy the deputies so these same deputies took the entire work of legislation into their own hands they constituted themselves the sole representatives of the nation the nobles and the clergy might indeed deliberate with them they were not altogether ignored but their interests and rights were to be disregarded in that state of ferment and discontent which existed when the states general was convened the nobles and the clergy probably knew the spirit of the deputies and therefore refused to sit with them they knew from the innumerable pamphlets and tracts which were issued from the press that radical changes were desired to which they themselves were opposed and they had the moral support of the government on their side the deputies of the third estate were bent on the destruction of feudalism as the only way to remedy the national evils which were so glaring and overwhelming 
they probably knew that their proceedings were unconstitutional and illegal but thought that their acts would be sanctioned by their patriotic intentions they were resolved to secure what seemed to them rights and thought little of duties if these inestimable and vital rights should be granted without usurpation they would be satisfied if not then they would resort to usurpation to them their course seemed to be dictated by the higher law what to them were legalities that perpetuated wrongs the constitution was made for man not man for the constitution had the three orders deliberated together in one hall although against precedent and legality the course of revolution might have been directed into a different channel or if an able and resolute king had been on the throne he might have united with the people against the nobles and secured all the reforms that were imperative without invoking revolution or he might have dispersed the deputies at the point of the bayonet and raised taxes by arbitrary imposition as able despots have ever done we cannot penetrate the secrets of providence it may have been ordered in divine justice and wisdom that the french people should work out their own deliverance in their own way in mistakes in suffering and in violence and point the eternal moral that in experience vanity and ignorance are fatal to sound legislation and sure to lead to errors which prove disastrous that natural progress is incompatible with crime that evils can only gradually be removed that wickedness ends in violence a majority of the deputies meant well they were earnest patriotic and enthusiastic but they knew nothing of the science of government or of constitution making which demand the highest maturity of experience and wisdom as i have said nearly four hundred of them were country lawyers as conceited as they were inexperienced both mirabeau and saez had a supreme contempt for them as a whole they wanted what they called rights and were determined to get them any way they could disregarding obstacles disregarding forms and precedents and they were backed up and urged forward by ignorant mobs and wicked demagogues who hated the throne the clergy and the nobles hence the deputies made mistakes they could see nothing better than unscrupulous destruction and they did not know how to reconstruct they were bewildered and embarrassed and listened to the orders of the palais royal the first thing of note which occurred when they resolved to call themselves the national assembly and not the third estate which they were only was done by mirabeau he ascended the tribune when brise the master of ceremonies came with a message from the king for them to join the other orders and said in his voice of melodious thunder we are here by the command of people and will only disperse by the force of bayonets from that moment till his death he ruled the assembly the disconcerted messenger returned to his sovereign what did the king say at this defiance of royal authority did he rise in wrath and indignation and order his guards to disperse the rebels no the amiable king said meekly well let them remain there what a king for such stormy times o shade of richelieu thy work has perished rousseau a greater genius than thou wert hath undermined the institutions and the despotism of two hundred years end of section one section two of beacon lights of history volume nine european statesman by john lord this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by k hand mirabeau part two only two courses were now open to the king this weak and kind-hearted louis the sixteenth heir of a hundred years misrule if he would maintain his power one was to join the reformers and cooperate in patriotic work assisted by progressive ministers whatever opposition might be raised by nobles and priests and the second was to arm himself and put down the deputies but how could this weak-minded sovereign cooperate with plebeians against the orders which sustained his throne and if he used violence he inaugurated civil war which would destroy thousands where revolution destroyed hundreds moreover the example of charles i was before him he dared not run the risk in such a torrent of revolutionary forces when even regular troops fraternized with citizens that experiment was dangerous and then he was tender-hearted and shrank from shedding innocent blood his queen marie antoinette the intrepid daughter of maria theresa with her austrian proclivities 
would have kept him firm and sustained him by her courageous counsels, but her influence was neutralized by popular ministers. Necker, the prosperous banker, the fortunate financier, advised half measures. Had he conciliated Mirabeau, who led the assembly, then even the throne might have been saved. But he detested and mistrusted the mighty tribune of the people, the aristocratic demagogue who, in spite of his political rancor and incendiary attracts, was the only great statesman of the day. He refused the aid of the only man who could have staved off the violence of factions, and brought reason and talent to the support of reform and law. At this period, after the triumph of the Third Estate, now called the National Assembly, and the paralysis of the court, perplexed and uncertain whether or not to employ violence and disband the assembly by royal decree, a great agitation began among the people, not merely in Paris, but over the whole kingdom. There were meetings to promote insurrection, paid disclaimers of human rights, speeches without end in the gardens of the Palais Royal, where Marat, Camille Desmoulins, and other popular orators harangued the excited crowds. There were insurrections at Versailles, which was filled with foreign soldiers. The French guards fraternized with the people whom they were to subdue. Necker, in despair, resigned, or was dismissed. None of the authorities could command obedience. The people were starving, and the bakers' shops were pillaged. The crowds broke open the prisons, and released many who had been summarily confined. Troops were poured into Paris, and the old Duke of Broglie, one of the heroes of the Seven Years' War, now war minister, sought to overawe the city. The gun-shops were plundered, and the rabble armed themselves with whatever weapons they could lay their hands upon. The National Assembly decreed the formation of a National Guard to quell disturbances, and placed Lafayette at the head of it. Besenval, who commanded the royal troops, was forced to withdraw from the capital. The city was completely in the hands of the insurgents, who were driven hither and thither by every passion which can sway the human soul. Patriotic zeal blended with envy, hatred, malice, revenge, and avarice. The mob at last attacked the Bastille, a formidable fortress where state prisoners were arbitrarily confined. In spite of moats and walls and guns, this gloomy monument of royal tyranny was easily taken, for it was manned by only about one hundred and forty men, and had as provisions only two sacks of flour. No aid could possibly come to the rescue. Resistance was impossible, in its unprepared state for defense, although its guns, if properly manned, might have demolished the whole Faubourg Saint-Antoine. The news of the fall of this fortress came like a thunderclap over Europe. It announced the reign of anarchy in France, and the helplessness of the king. On hearing of the fall of the Bastille, the king is said to have exclaimed to his courtiers, It is a revolt, then. Nay, sire, said the Duke of Liancourt, it is a revolution. It was evident that even then the king did not comprehend the situation. But how few could comprehend it! Only one man saw the full tendency of things and shuddered at the consequences, and this man was Mirabeau. The king, at last aroused, appeared in person in the National Assembly, and announced the withdrawal of the troops from Paris and the recall of Necker. But general mistrust was alive in every bosom, and disorders still continued to a frightful extent, even in the provinces. In Brittany the towns appointed new municipalities, and armed a civic guard from the royal magazines. In Cayenne, the people stormed the citadel and killed the officers of the salt tax. Nowhere were royal intendants seen. The custom houses at the gates of the provincial cities were demolished. In Franche Comte, a noble castle was burned every day. All kinds of property were exposed to the most shameful robbery. Then took place the emigration of the nobles, among whom were Condé, Polignac, Broglie, to organize resistance to the revolution which had already conquered the king. Meanwhile, the triumphant assembly, largely recruited by the liberal nobles and the clergy, continued its sessions, decreed its sittings permanent, and its members inviolable. The sittings were stormy, for everybody made speeches, written or oral, yet few had any power of debate. Even Mirabeau himself, before whom all succumbed, was deficient in this talent. He could thunder, he could arouse or allay passions, he seemed able to grasp every subject, for he used other people's brains. He was an incarnation of eloquence, 
but he could not reply to his opponents with much effect, like Pitt, Webster, and Gladstone. He was still the leading man in the kingdom, all eyes were directed towards him, and no one could compete with him, not even Saez. The assembly wasted days in foolish debates. It had begun its proceedings with the famous Declaration of the Rights of Man, an abstract question first mooted by Rousseau and re-echoed by Jefferson. Mirabeau was appointed with a committee of five to draft the Declaration, in one sense a puerile fiction, since men are not born free, but in a state of dependence and weakness, nor equal, either in regard to fortune or talents or virtue or rank, but in another sense a great truth, so far as men are entitled by nature to equal privileges and freedom of the person, and unrestricted liberty to get a living according to their choice. The assembly at last set itself in earnest to the work of legislation. In one night, the ever-memorable 4th of August, it decreed the total abolition of feudalism. In one night it abolished tithes to the church, provincial privileges, feudal rights, serfdom, the law of primogeniture, seigneurial dues, and the gabelle, or tax on salt. Mirabeau was not present, being absent on his pleasures. These, however, seldom interfered with his labors, which were Herculean, from seven in the morning till eleven at night. He had two sides to his character, one exciting abhorrence and disgust, for his pleasures were miscellaneous and coarse, a man truly abandoned to the most violent passions, the other side pleasing, exciting admiration, a man with an enormous power of work, affable, dignified, with courtly manners, and enchanting conversation, making friends with everybody, out of real kindness of heart, because he really loved the people and sought their highest good, a truly patriotic man, and as wise as he was enthusiastic. This great orator and statesman was outraged and alarmed at the indecent haste of the assembly, and stigmatized its proceedings as nocturnal orgies. The assembly on that memorable night swept away the whole feudal edifice, and in less time than the English Parliament would take to decide upon the first reading of any bill of importance. The following day brought reflection and discontent. "'That is just the character of our Frenchmen,' exclaimed Mirabeau. They are three months disputing about syllables, and in a single night they overturn the whole venerable edifice of the monarchy. Saez was equally disgusted, and made a speech of great force to show that to abolish tithes without an indemnity was spoliating the clergy to enrich the landowners. He concluded, You know how to be free, you do not know how to be just. But he was regarded as an ecclesiastic, unable to forego his personal interests. He gave vent to his irritated feelings in a conversation with Mirabeau, when the latter said, My dear Abbe, you have let loose the bull, and now you complain that he gores you. It was this political priest who had made the first assault on the Constitution, when he urged the Third Estate to decree itself the nation. The National Assembly had destroyed feudal institutions, but it had not yet made a constitution or restored order. Violence and anarchy still reigned. Then the clubs began to make themselves a power. Come, said the lawyer Danton to a friend in the district of the Cordeliers. Come and howl with us. You will earn much money, and you can still choose your party afterwards. But it was in the garden of the Palais Royal, and in the church of the old Jacobins, that the most violent attacks were made on all existing institutions. A fourth estate, of able editors, also springs up, increases, multiplies, irrepressible, incalculable. Then from the lowest quarters of Paris surge up an insurrection of women, who march to Versailles in disorder, penetrate the assembly, and invade the palace. On the 5th of October a mob joins them, of the lowest rabble, and succeed in forcing their way into the precincts of the palace. The King de Paris was now the general cry, and Louis the Sixteenth appears upon the balcony and announces by gestures his subjection to their will. A few hours after, the king is on his way to Paris, under the protection of the National Guard, really a prisoner in the hands of the people. In fourteen days the National Assembly also follows, to be now dictated to by the clubs. In this state of anarchy and incipient violence, Mirabeau, whose power in the Assembly was still unimpaired, wished to halt. He foresaw the future. No man in France had such clear insight and sagacity as he. He saw the state drifting into dissolution, and put forth his hand and raised his voice to arrest the catastrophe which he lamented. The mob of Paris, said he, will scourge the corpses of the king and queen. 
it was then that he gave but feeble support to the rights of man and contended for the unlimited veto of the king on the proceedings of the assembly he also brought forward a motion to allow the king's ministers to take part in the debates on the seventh of october he exhorted the count de marc to tell the king that his throne and kingdom were lost if he did not immediately quit paris and he did all he could to induce him through the voice of his friends to identify himself with the cause of reform as the only means for the salvation of the throne he warned him against fleeing to the frontier to join the emigrants as the prelude of civil war he advocated a new ministry of more vigor and breadth he wanted a government both popular and strong he wished to retain the monarchy but desired a constitutional monarchy like that of england his hostility to all feudal institutions was intense and he did not seek to have any of them restored it was the abolition of feudal privileges which was really the permanent bequest of the french revolution they have never been revived no succeeding government has even attempted to revive them on the removal of the national assembly to paris mirabeau took a large house and lived ostentatiously and at great expense until he died from which it is supposed that he received pensions from england spain and even the french court this is intimated by dumont and i think it probable it will in part account for the conservative course he adopted to check the excesses of that revolution which he more than any other man invoked he was doubtless patriotic and uttered his warning protests with sincerity still it is easy to believe that so corrupt and extravagant a man in his private life was accessible to bribery such a man must have money and he was willing to get it from any quarter it is certain that he was regarded by the royal family towards the close of his career very differently from what they regarded him when the states general was assembled but if he was paid by different courts it is true that he then gave his support to the cause of law and constitutional liberty and doubtless loathed the excesses which took place in the name of liberty he was the only man who could have saved the monarchy if it were possible to save it but no human force could probably have arrested the waves of revolutionary frenzy at this time on the removal of the assembly to paris the all-absorbing questions related to finance the state was bankrupt it was difficult to raise money for the most pressing exigencies money must be had or there would be a universal anarchy and despair how could it be raised the credit of the country was gone and all means of taxation were exhausted no man in france had such a horror of bankruptcy as mirabeau and his eloquence was never more convincing and commanding than in his finance speeches nobody could reply to him the assembly was completely subjugated by his commanding talents nor was his influence ever greater than when he supported necker's proposal for a patriotic loan a sort of income tax in a masterly speech which excited universal admiration ah monsieur le comte said a great actor to him on that occasion what a speech and with what an accent did you deliver it you have surely missed your vocation but the finances were in a hopeless state with credit gone taxation exhausted and a continually increasing floating debt the situation was truly appalling to any statesman it was at this juncture that talleyrand a priest of noble birth as able as he was unscrupulous brought forth his famous measure for the spoliation of the church to which body he belonged and to which he was a disgrace talleyrand as bishop of autun had been one of the original representatives of the clergy on the first convocation of the states general he had advocated combining with the third estate when they pronounced themselves the national assembly had himself joined the assembly attracted notice by his speeches been appointed to draw up a constitution taken active part in the declaration of rights and made himself generally conspicuous and efficient at the present apparently hopeless financial crisis talleyrand uncovered a new source of revenue claimed that the property of the church belonged to the nation and that as the nation was on the brink of financial ruin this confiscation was a supreme necessity the church lands represented a value of two thousand millions of francs an immense sum which if sold would relieve it was supposed the necessities of the state mirabeau although he was no friend of the clergy shrank from such a monstrous injustice and said that such a wound as this would prove the most poisonous which the country had received but such was the urgent need of money that the assembly on the second of november seventeen eighty nine decreed that the property of the church should be put at the disposal of the state 
on the nineteenth of december it was decreed that these lands should be sold the clergy raised the most piteous cries of grief and indignation vainly did the bishops offer four hundred millions as a gift to the nation it was like the offer of darius to alexander of one hundred thousand talents your whole property is mine said the conqueror your kingdom is mine so the offer of the bishops was rejected and their whole property was taken and it was taken under the sophistical plea that it belonged to the nation it was really the gift of various benefactors in different ages to the church for pious purposes and had been universally recognized as sacred it was as sacred as any other rights of property the spoliation was indefinitely worse than the suppression of the monasteries by henry the eighth he had some excuse since they had become a scandal had misused their wealth and diverted it from the purposes originally intended the only wholesale attack on property by the state which can be compared with it was the abolition of slavery by the stroke of a pen in the american rebellion but this was a war measure when the country was in most imminent peril and it was also a moral measure in behalf of philanthropy the spoliation of the clergy by the national assembly was a great injustice since it was not urged that the clergy had misused their wealth or were neglectful of their duties as english monks were in the time of henry the eighth this church property had been held so sacred that louis the fourteenth in his greatest necessities never presumed to appropriate any part of it the sophistry that it belonged to the nation and therefore that the representatives of the nation had a right to take it probably deceived nobody it was necessary to give some excuse or reason for such a wholesale robbery and this was the best which could be invented the simple truth was that money at this juncture was a supreme necessity to the state and this spoliation seemed the easiest way to meet the public wants like most of the legislation of the assembly it was defended on the jesuit plea of expediency that the end justifies the means the plea of unscrupulous and wicked politicians in all countries and this expediency doubtless relieved the government for a time for the government was in the hands of the assembly royal authority was a mere shadow in reality the king was a prisoner guarded by lafayette in the palace of the tuileries and the assembly itself was now in fear of the people as represented by the clubs there were two hundred jacobin clubs in paris and other cities at this time howling their vituperations not only on royalty but also on everything else which was not already destroyed end of section two section three of beacon lights of history volume nine european statesmen by john lord this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by k hand mirabeau part three the assembly having provided for the wants of the government by this confiscation of two thousand millions which however when sold did not realize half that sum included their assignats or bonds representing parcels of land assigned to redeem them these were mostly one hundred franc notes though there were also issues of ten and even five francs the national credit was thus patched up by legislators who took a constitution in hand to quote burke as savages would a looking-glass then they proceeded to other reforms and abolished the parliaments and instituted the election of judges by the people thus stripping the king of his few remaining powers in the meantime mirabeau died worn out with labors and passions and some say by poison even this hercules could not resist the consequences of violated natural law the assembly decreed a magnificent public funeral and buried him with great pomp he was the first to be interred in the pantheon for nearly two years he was the leading man in france and he retained his influence in the assembly to the end nor did he lose his popularity with the people it is not probable that his intrigues to save the monarchy were known except to a few confidential friends he died at the right time for his fame in april seventeen ninety one had he lived he could not have arrested the tide of revolutionary excesses and the reign of demagogues and probably would have been one of the victims of the guillotine as an author mirabeau does not rank high his fame rests on his speeches his eloquence was transcendent so far as it was rendered vivid by passion he knew how to move men he understood human nature no orator 
by felicitous expressions in the tribune he was immovable his self-possession never left him in the greatest disorders he was always master of himself his voice was full manly and sonorous and pleased the ear always powerful yet flexible it could be as distinctly heard when he lowered it as when he raised it his knowledge was not remarkable but he had an almost miraculous faculty of appropriating whatever he heard he paid the greatest attention to his dress and wore an enormous quantity of hair dressed in the fashion of the day when i shake my terrible locks said he no one dares interrupt me though he received pensions he was too proud to be dishonest in the ordinary sense he received large sums but died insolvent he had like most frenchmen an inordinate vanity and loved incense from all ranks and conditions although he was the first to support the assembly against the king he was essentially in favor of monarchy and maintained the necessity of the absolute veto he would have given a constitution to his country as nearly resembling that of england as local circumstances would permit had he lived the destinies of france might have been different but his death gave courage to all the factions and violence and crime were consummated by the reign of terror with the death of mirabeau closed the first epoch of the revolution thus far it had been earnest but unscrupulous in the violation of rights and in the destruction of ancient abuses yet if inexperienced and rash it was not marked by deeds of blood in this first form it was marked by enthusiasm and hope and patriotic zeal not as afterwards by fears and cruelty and usurpations henceforth the revolution took another turn it was directed not by men of genius not by reformers seeking to rule by wisdom but by demagogues and jacobin clubs and the mobs of the city of paris what was called the left in the meetings of the assembly made up of fanatics whom mirabeau despised and detested gained a complete ascendancy and adopted the extremist measures under their guidance the destruction of the monarchy was complete feudalism and the church property had been swept away and the royal authority now received its final blow nay the king himself was slain under the influence of fear it is true but accompanied by acts of cruelty and madness which shocked the whole civilized world and gave an eternal stain to the revolution itself it was not now reform but unscrupulous destruction and violence which marked the assembly controlled as it was by jacobin orators and infidel demagogues a frenzy seized the nation it feared reactionary movements and the interference of foreign powers when the bastille had fallen it was by the hands of half-starved people clamoring for bread but when the monarchy was attacked it was from sentiments of fear among those who had the direction of affairs the king at last alarmed for his own safety contrived to escape from the tuileries where he was virtually under arrest for his power was gone but he was recaptured and brought back to paris a prisoner robespierre called upon the assembly to bring the king and queen to trial marat proposed a military dictatorship to act more summarily which proposal produced a temporary reaction in favor of royalty lafayette as commander of the national guard declared if you kill the king to-day i will place the dauphin on the throne to-morrow but the republican party now in fear of a reaction was increasing rapidly its leaders were at this time the girondists bent on the suppression of royalty and headed by brissot who agitated france by his writings in favor of a republic while madame roland opened her salons for intrigues and cabals a bright woman who dreamed of spartan severity roman virtue and plutarch heroes the national assembly dissolved itself in september and appealed to the country for the election of a national convention for the king having been formally suspended august tenth there was no government the first act of the convention was to proclaim the republic then occurred the more complete organization of the jacobin club to control the national convention and this was followed by the rapid depreciation of the assignats bread riots and all sorts of disturbances added to these evils foreign governments were aiming to suppress the revolution and war had been declared by the girondist ministry of which de maurier was war minister at this crisis danton of the club of the cordeliers who found the jacobins too respectable became a power a coarse vulgar man but of indefatigable energy and activity who wished to do away with all order and responsibility he attacked the girondie as not sufficiently violent 
it was now war between the different sections of the revolutionists themselves lafayette resolved to suppress the dangerous radicals by force but found it no easy thing for the convention was controlled by men of violence who filled the country with alarm not of their unscrupulous measures but of the military and of foreign enemies he even narrowly escaped impeachment at the hands of the national convention the convention is now overawed and controlled by the commune and the clubs lafayette flies the mob rules paris the revolutionary tribunal is decreed robespierre marat and danton form a triumvirate of power the september massacres take place the girondists become conservative and attempt to stay the progress of further excesses all to no purpose for the king himself is now impeached and the jacobins control everything the king is led to the bar of the convention he is condemned by a majority only of one and immured in the temple on the twentieth of january seventeen ninety three he was condemned and the next day he mounted the scaffold we have burned our ships said marat when the tragedy was consummated with the death of the king i bring this lecture to a close it would be interesting to speculate on what might have been averted had mirabeau lived but probably nothing could have saved the monarchy except civil war to which louis the sixteenth was averse nor can I dwell on the second part of the revolution when the government was in the hands of those fiends and fanatics who turned France into one vast slaughterhouse of butchery and blood. I have only to say that the same unseen hand which humiliated the nobles, impoverished the clergy, and destroyed the king, also visited with retribution those monsters who had a leading hand in the work of destruction. Marat, the infidel journalist, was stabbed by Charlotte Corday denton the minister of justice and orator of the revolutionary clubs was executed on the scaffold he had erected for so many innocent men robespierre the sentimental murderer and arch conspirator also expiated his crimes on the scaffold as did saint just lebas couthon and roy and other legalized assassins as the girondists sacrificed the royal family so did the jacobins sacrifice the girondists and the convention filled with consternation again sacrificed the jacobins after the work of destruction was consummated and there was nothing more to destroy and starvation was imminent at paris and general detestation began to prevail in view of the atrocities committed in the name of liberty the crushing fact became apparent that the nations of europe were arming to put down the revolution and restore the monarchy in a generous paroxysm of patriotism the whole nation armed to resist the invaders and defend the ideas of the revolution the convention also perceived too late that anything was better than anarchy and license it put down the clubs restored religious worship destroyed the busts of the monsters who had disgraced their cause and country entrusted supreme power to five directors able and patriotic and dissolved itself under the directory the third act of the drama of revolution opened with the gallant resistance which france made to the invaders of her soil and the enemies of her liberties this resistance brought out the marvellous military genius of napoleon who intoxicated the nation by his victories and who in reward of his extraordinary services was made first consul with dictatorial powers the abuse of these powers his usurpation of imperial dignity the wars into which he was drawn to maintain his ascendancy and his final defeat at waterloo constitute the most brilliant chapter in the history of modern times the revolution was succeeded by military despotism inexperience led to fatal mistakes and these mistakes made the strong government of a single man a necessity the revolution began in noble aspirations but for lack of political wisdom and sound principles in religion and government it ended in anarchy and crime and was again followed by the tyranny of a monarch this is the sequence of all revolutions which defy eternal justice and human experience there are few evils which are absolutely unendurable and permanent reforms are only obtained by patience and wisdom violence is ever succeeded by usurpation the terrible wars through which france passed to aggrandize an ambitious and selfish egotist were attended with far greater evils than those which the nation sought to abolish when the states general first met at versailles but the experiment of liberty though it failed was not altogether thrown away lessons of political wisdom were learned which no nation will ever forget some great rights of immense value were secured and many grievous privileges passed away forever neither louis the eighteenth nor charles the tenth nor louis philippe nor louis napoleon ever attempted to restore feudalism or unequal privileges or arbitrary taxation 
the legislative power never again completely succumbed to the decrees of royal and imperial tyrants the sovereignty of the people was established as one of the fixed ideas of the nineteenth century and the representatives of the people are now the supreme rulers of the land a man can now rise in france above the condition in which he was born and can aspire to any office and position which are bestowed on talents and genius bastilles and Lettre de cachet have become an impossibility religious toleration is as free there as in england or the united states education is open to the poor and is encouraged by the government constitutional government seems to be established under whatever name the executive may be called france is again one of the most prosperous and contented countries of europe and the only great drawback to her national prosperity is that which also prevents other continental powers from developing their resources the large standing army which she feels it imperative to sustain in view of the inexperience and fanaticism of the revolutionists and the dreadful evils which took place after the fall of the monarchy we should say that the revolution was premature and that substantial reforms might have been gained without violence but this is a mere speculation one thing we do know that the revolution was a national uprising against injustice and oppression when the torch is applied to a venerable edifice we cannot determine the extent of the conflagration or the course which it will take the french revolution was plainly one of the developments of a nation's progress to conservative and reverential minds it was a horrid form for progress to take since it was visionary and infidel but all nations are in the hands of god who is above all second causes and i know of no modern movement to which the words of karl when he was an optimist when he wrote the most original and profound of his works the sartor resartus apply with more force when the phoenix is fanning her funeral pyre will there not be sparks flying alas some millions of men have been sucked into that high eddying flame and like moths consumed in the burning of the world phoenix destruction and creation proceed together and as the ashes of the old are blown about do new forces mysteriously spin themselves and melodious death songs are succeeded by more melodious birth songs yet all progress is slow especially in government and morals and how forcibly are we impressed in surveying the varied phases of the french revolution that nothing but justice and right should guide men in their reforms that robbery and injustice in the name of liberty and progress are still robbery and injustice to be visited with righteous retribution and that those rulers and legislators who cannot make passions and interests subservient to reason are not fit for the work assigned to them it is miserable hypocrisy and cant to talk of a revolutionary necessity for violating the first principles of human society ah it is reason intelligence and duty calm as the voice of angels soothing as the music of the spheres which alone should guide nations in all crises and difficulties to the attainment of those rights and privileges on which all true progress is based authorities dumont's recollections of mirabeau carlyle's french revolution carlyle's article on mirabeau in his miscellanies von seibel's french revolution thiers french revolution minier's french revolution croker's essays on the french revolution life of lafayette laustelot's revolution de paris burke's reflections on the french revolution carlyle's article on danton Malet du Paz, Considerations sur la Révolution Françoise, Biographie Universelle, A la Mets, Histoire de l'Assemblée Constituante, Allison's History of the French Revolution, La Martine's History of the Girondists, La Cretelle's History of France, Montigny's Memoirs sur Mirabeau, Pouchet's Memoirs sur Mirabeau, Madame de Stael's Considerations sur la Révolution Française, Macaulay's Essay on Dumont's Recollections of Mirabeau. End of section three. Section four of Beacon Lights of History, Volume Nine: European Statesmen by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Edmund Burke, Part One, A.D. seventeen twenty nine to seventeen ninety seven, Political Morality. It would be difficult to select an example of a more lofty and irreproachable character among the great statesmen of England than Edmund Burke. 
He is not a puzzle like Oliver Cromwell, although there are inconsistencies in the opinions he advanced from time to time. He takes very much the same place in the parliamentary history of his country as Cicero took in the Roman Senate. Like that greatest of Roman orators and statesmen, Burke was upright, conscientious, conservative, religious, and profound. Like him, he lifted up his earnest voice against corruption in the government, against great state criminals, against demagogues, against rash innovations. Whatever diverse opinions may exist as to his political philosophy, there is only one opinion as to his character, which commands universal respect. Although he was the most conservative of statesmen, clinging to the Constitution, and to consecrated traditions and associations both in church and state, still his name is associated with the most important and salutary reforms which England made for half a century. He seems to have been sent to instruct and guide legislators in a venal and corrupt age. To my mind, Burke looms up, after the lapse of a century, as a prodigy of thought and knowledge, devoted to the good of his country, an unselfish and disinterested patriot, as wise and sagacious as he was honest, a sage whose moral wisdom shines brighter and brighter, since it was based on the immutable principles of justice and morality. One can extract more profound and striking epigrams from his speeches and writings than from any prose writer that England has produced, if we accept Francis Bacon. And these writings and speeches are still valued as among the most precious legacies of former generations. They form a thesaurus of political wisdom which statesmen can never exhaust. Burke has left an example which all statesmen will do well to follow. He was not a popular favorite like Fox and Pitt. He was not born to greatness like North and Newcastle. He was not liked by the king or the nobility. He was generally in the ranks of the opposition. He was a new man like Cicero in an aristocratic age. Yet he conquered by his genius the proudest prejudices. He fought his way upward inch by inch. He was the founder of a new national policy, although it was bitterly opposed, and he died universally venerated for his integrity, wisdom, and foresight. He was the most remarkable man, on the whole, who has taken part in public affairs, from the Revolution to our times. Of course, the life and principles of so great a man are a study. If history has any interest or value, it is to show the influence of such a man on his own age and the ages which have succeeded, to point out his contribution to civilization. Edmund Burke was born, 1730, of respectable parents in Ireland. He was educated at Trinity College, Dublin, where he made a fair proficiency, but did not give the promise of those rare powers which he afterwards exhibited. He was no prodigy like Cicero, Pitt, and Macaulay. He early saw that his native country presented no adequate field for him, and turned his steps to London at the age of twenty, where he entered as a student of law in the Inner Temple, since the bar was then what it was at Rome, what it still is in modern capitals, the usual resort of ambitious young men. But Burke did not like the law as a profession, and early dropped the study of it, not because he failed in industry, for he was the most plodding of students, not because he was deficient in the gift of speech, for he was a born orator, not because his mind repelled severe logical deductions, for he was the most philosophical of the great orators of his day, not because the law was not a noble field for the exercise of the highest faculties of the mind, but probably because he was won by the superior fascinations of literature and philosophy. Bacon could unite the study of divine philosophy with professional labors as a lawyer, also with the duties of a legislator, but the instances are rare where men have united three distinct spheres and gained equal distinction in all. Cicero did, and Bacon, and Lord Brougham, but not Erskine, nor Pitt, nor Canning. Even two spheres are as much as most distinguished men have filled, the law with politics like Thurlow and Webster, or politics with literature like Gladstone and Disraeli. Dr. Johnson, Garrick, and Reynolds, the early friends of Burke, filled only one sphere. The early literary life of Burke was signalized by his essay on the sublime and beautiful, original in its design and execution, a model of philosophical criticism, extorting the highest praises from Dugald Stewart and the Abbe Raynal, and attracting so much attention that it speedily became a textbook in the universities. Fortunately, he was able to pursue literature with the aid of a small patrimony, about three hundred pounds a year, without being doomed to the hard privations of Johnson or the humiliating shifts of Goldsmith. 
he lived independently of patronage from the great the bitterest trial of the literati of the eighteenth century which drove cowper mad and sent rousseau to attics and solitudes so that in his humble but pleasant home with his young wife with whom he lived amicably he could see his friends the great men of the age and bestow an unostentatious charity and maintain his literary rank and social respectability i have sometimes wondered why burke did not pursue this quiet and beautiful life free from the turmoils of public contest with leisure and friends and nature and truth and prepared treatises which would have been immortal for he was equal to anything he attempted but such was not to be he was needed in the house of commons then composed chiefly of fox-hunting squires and younger sons of nobles a body as ignorant as it was aristocratic the representatives not of the people but of the landed proprietors intent on aggrandizing their families at the expense of the nation and of fortunate merchants manufacturers and capitalists in love with monopolies such an assembly needed at that day a schoolmaster a teacher in the principles of political economy and political wisdom a leader in reforming disgraceful abuses a lecturer on public duties and public wrongs a patriot who had other views than spoils and place a man who saw the right and was determined to uphold it whatever the number or power of his opponents so edmund burke was sent among them ambitious doubtless stern intellectually proud incorruptible independent not disdainful of honors and influence but eager to render public services it has been the great ambition of englishmen since the revolution to enter parliament not merely for political influence but also for social position only rich men or members of great families have found it easy to do so to such men a pecuniary compensation is a small affair hence members of parliament have willingly served without pay which custom has kept poor men of ability from aspiring to the position it was not easy even for such a man as burke to gain admission into this aristocratic assembly he did not belong to a great family he was only a man of genius learning and character the squirearchy of that age cared no more for literary fame than the roman aristocracy did for a poet or an actor so burke ambitious and able as he was must bide his time his first stop in a political career was as private secretary to gerard hamilton who was famous for having made but one speech and who was chief secretary to the lord lieutenant of ireland the earl of halifax burke soon resigned his situation in disgust since he was not willing to be a mere political tool but his singular abilities had attracted the attention of the prime minister lord rockingham who made him his private secretary and secured his entrance into parliament lord verney for a seat in the privy council was induced to give him a rotten borough burke entered the house of commons in seventeen sixty five at thirty five years of age he began his public life when the nation was ruled by the great whig families whose ancestors had fought the battles of reform in the times of charles and james this party had held power for seventy years had forgotten the principles of the revolution and had become venal and selfish dividing among its chiefs the spoils of office it had become as absolute and unscrupulous as the old kings whom it had once dethroned it was an oligarchy of a few powerful whig noblemen whose rule was supreme in england burke joined this party but afterwards deserted it or rather broke it up when he perceived its arbitrary character and its disregard of the fundamental principles of the constitution he was able to do this after its unsuccessful attempt to coerce the american colonies american difficulties were the great issue of that day the majority of the parliament both lords and commons sustained by king george the third one of the most narrow-minded obstinate and stupid princes who ever reigned in england who believed in an absolute jurisdiction over the colonies as an integral part of the empire and was bent not only in enforcing this jurisdiction but also resorted to the most offensive and impolitic measures to accomplish it this omnipotent parliament fancying it had a right to tax america without her consent without a representation even was resolved to carry out the abstract rights of a supreme governing power both in order to assert its prerogative and to please certain classes in england who wished relief from the burden of taxation and because parliament had this power it would use it against the dictates of expediency and the instincts of common sense yea in defiance of the great elemental truth in government that even thrones rest on the affections of the people 
blinded and infatuated with notions of prerogative it would not even learn lessons from that conquered country which for five hundred years it had vainly attempted to coerce and which it could finally govern only by a recognition of its rights now the great career of burke began by opposing the leading opinions of his day in reference to the coercion of the american colonies he discarded all theories and abstract rights he would not even discuss the subject whether parliament had a right to tax the colonies he took the side of expediency and common sense it was enough for him that it was foolish and irritating to attempt to exercise abstract powers which could not be carried out he foresaw and he predicted the consequences of attempting to coerce such a people as the americans with the forces which england could command he pointed out the infatuation of the ministers of the crown then led by lord north his speech against the boston port bill was one of the most brilliant specimens of oratory ever displayed in the house of commons he did not encourage the colonies in rebellion but pointed out the course they would surely pursue if the irritating measures of the government were not withdrawn he advocated conciliation the withdrawal of theoretic rights the repeal of obnoxious taxes the removal of restrictions on american industry the withdrawal of monopolies and of ungenerous distinctions he would bind the two countries together by a cord of love when some member remarked that it was horrible for children to rebel against their parents burke replied it is true the americans are our children but when children ask for bread shall we give them a stone for ten years he labored with successive administrations to procure reconciliation he spoke nearly every day he appealed to reason to justice to common sense but every speech he made was a battle with ignorance and prejudice if you must employ your strength he said indignantly employ it to uphold some honorable right i do not enter upon metaphysical distinctions i hate the very name of them nobody can be argued into slavery if you cannot reconcile your sovereignty with their freedom the colonists will cast your sovereignty in your face it is not enough that a statesman means well duty demands that what is right should not only be made known but be made prevalent that what is evil should not only be detected but be defeated do not dream that your registers your bonds your affidavits your instructions are the things which hold together the great texture of the mysterious whole these dead instruments do not make a government it is the spirit that pervades and vivifies an empire which infuses that obedience without which your army would be a base rabble and your navy nothing but rotten timber such is a fair specimen of his eloquence earnest practical to the point yet appealing to exalted sentiments and pervaded with moral wisdom the result of learning as well as the dictate of a generous and enlightened policy when reason failed he resorted to sarcasm and mockery because said he we have a right to tax america we must do it risk everything forfeit everything take into consideration nothing but our right oh infatuated ministers like a silly man full of his prerogative over the beasts of the field who says there is wool on the back of a wolf and therefore he must be sheared what shear a wolf yes but have you considered the trouble oh i have considered nothing but my right a wolf is an animal that has wool all animals that have wool are to be sheared and therefore i will shear the wolf but i need not enlarge on his noble efforts to prevent a war with the colonies they were all in vain you cannot reason with infatuation quem deus vult perder prius dementat the logic of events at last showed the wisdom of burke and the folly of the king and his ministers and of the nation at large the disasters and the humiliation which attended the american war compelled the ministry to resign and the marquis of rockingham became prime minister in seventeen eighty two and burke the acknowledged leader of his party became paymaster of the forces an office at one time worth twenty five thousand pounds a year before the reform which burke had instigated but this great statesman was not admitted to the cabinet george the third did not like him and his connections were not sufficiently powerful to overcome the royal objection in our times he would have been rewarded with a seat on the treasury bench with less talents than he had the commoners of our day become prime ministers but burke did not long enjoy even the office of paymaster on the death of lord rockingham a few months after he had formed the ministry burke retired from the only office he ever held and he retired to beaconsfield an estate which he had purchased with the assistance of his friend rockingham where he lived when parliamentary duties permitted in that state of blended elegance leisure and study which is to be found in the greatest perfection in england alone 
the political power of burke culminated at the close of the war with america but not his political influence and there is a great difference between power and influence nor do we read that burke after this headed the opposition that position was shared by charles james fox who ultimately supplanted his master as the leader of his party not because burke declined in wisdom or energy but because fox had more skill as a debater more popular sympathies and more influential friends burke like gladstone was too stern too irritable too imperious too intellectually proud perhaps too unyielding to control such an ignorant prejudiced and aristocratic body as the house of commons jealous of his ascendancy and writhing under his rebukes it must have been galling to the great philosopher to yield to the palm of lesser men but such has ever been the destiny of genius except in crises of public danger of all things that politicians hate is the domination of a man who will not stoop to flatter who cannot be bribed and who will be certain to expose vices and wrongs the world will not bear rebukes the fate of prophets is to be stoned a stern moral greatness is repulsive to the weak and wicked parties reward mediocre men whom they can use or bend and the greatest benefactors lose their popularity when they oppose the enthusiasm of new ideas or become austere in their instructions thus the greatest statesman that this country has produced since alexander hamilton lost his prestige when his conciliating policy became offensive to a rising party whose watchword was the higher law although by his various conflicts with southern leaders and his loyalty to the constitution he educated the people to sustain the very war which he foresaw and dreaded and had that accomplished senator from massachusetts charles sumner who succeeded to webster's seat and who in his personal appearance and advocacy for reform strikingly resembled burke had he remained uninjured to our day with increasing intellectual powers and profounder moral wisdom i doubt whether even he would have had much influence with our present legislators for he had all the intellectual defects of both burke and webster and never was so popular as either of them at one period of their career while he certainly was inferior to both in native force experience and attainments the chief labors of burke for the first ten years of his parliamentary life had been mainly in connection with american affairs and which the result proved he comprehended better than any man in england those of the next ten years were directed principally to indian difficulties in which he showed the same minuteness of knowledge the same grasp of intellect the same moral wisdom the same good sense and the same regard for justice that he had shown concerning the colonies but in discussing indian affairs his eloquence takes a loftier flight he is less conciliating more in earnest more concerned with the principles of immutable obligations he abhors the cruelties and tyranny inflicted on india by clive and hastings he could see no good from an aggrandizement purchased by injustice and wrong if it was criminal for an individual to cheat and steal it was equally atrocious for a nation to plunder and oppress another nation infidel or pagan white or black a righteous anger burned in the breast of burke as he reflected on the wrongs and miseries of the natives of india why should that ancient country be ruled for no other purpose than to enrich the younger sons of a grasping aristocracy and the servants of an insatiable and unscrupulous company whose monopoly of spoils was the scandal of the age if ever a reform was imperative in the government of a colony it was surely in india where the government was irresponsible the english courts of justice there were more terrible to the natives than the very wrongs they pretended to redress the customs and laws and moral ideas of the conquered country were spurned and ignored by the greedy scions of gentility who were sent to rule a population ten times larger than that between the humber and the thames so burke after the most careful study of the condition of india lifted up his voice against the inequities which were winked at by parliament but his fierce protest arrayed against him all the parties that endorsed these wrongs or who were benefited by them i need not dwell on his protracted labors for ten years in behalf of right without the sympathies of those who had formerly supported him no speeches were ever made in the english house of commons which equalled in eloquence and power those he made on the nabob of arcot's debts and the impeachment of warren hastings in these famous philippics he fearlessly exposed the peculations the misrule the oppression and the inhuman heartlessness of the company's servants speeches which extorted admiration while they humiliated and chastised 
I need not describe the nine years' prosecution of a great criminal and the escape of Hastings, more guilty and more fortunate than Vares, from the punishment he merited, through legal technicalities, the apathy of men in power, the private influence of the throne, and the sympathies which fashion excited in his behalf, and more than all, because of the undoubted service he had rendered to his country, if it was a service to extend her rule by questionable means to the farthermost limits of the globe. I need not speak of the obloquy which Burke incurred from the press, which teemed with pamphlets and books and articles to undermine his great authority, all in the interest of venal and powerful monopolists. Nor did he escape the wrath of the electors of Bristol, a narrow-minded town of India traders and negro dealers, who withdrew from him their support. He had been solicited, in the midst of his former éclat, to represent this town, rather than the rotten borough of Wendover, and he proudly accepted the honor and was the idol of his constituents until he presumed to disregard their instructions in matters which he considered they were incompetent to judge. His famous letter to the electors, in which he refutes and ridicules their claim to instruct him, as the shoemakers of Lynn wished to instruct Daniel Webster, is a model of irony, as well as a dignified rebuke of all ignorant constituencies, and a lofty exposition of the duties of a statesman rather than of a politician. He had also incurred the displeasure of the Bristol electors by his manly defense of the rights of the Irish Catholics, who, since the conquest of William the Third, had been subjected to the most unjust and annoying treatment that ever disgraced a Protestant government. The injustices under which Ireland groaned were nearly as repulsive as the cruelties inflicted upon the Protestants of France during the reign of Louis the Fourteenth. On the suppression of the rebellion under Tyrconnell, says Morley, nearly the whole of the land was confiscated, the peasants were made beggars and outlaws, the penal laws against Catholics were enforced, and the peasants were prostrate in despair. Even in 1765, the native Irish were regarded by their Protestant oppressors with exactly that combination of intense contempt and loathing, rage and terror, which his American counterpart would have divided between the Indian and the Negro. Not the least of the labors of Burke was to bring to the attention of the nation the wrongs inflicted on the Irish, and the impossibility of ruling a people who had such just grounds for discontent. His letter upon the propriety of admitting Catholics to the elective franchise is one of the wisest of all his productions. So enlightened is its idea of toleration, so sagacious is its comprehension of political exigencies. He did not live to see his ideas carried out, but he was among the first to prepare the way for Catholic emancipation in later times. But a greater subject than colonial rights or Indian wrongs or persecution of the Irish Catholics agitated the mind of Burke, to which he devoted the energies of his declining years. And this was the agitation growing out of the French Revolution. When that roaring conflagration of anarchies broke out, he was in the full maturity of his power and his fame, a wise old statesman, versed in the lessons of human experience, who detested sophistries and abstract theories and violent reforms. A man who, while he loved liberty more than any political leader of his day, loathed the crimes committed in its name, and who was skeptical of any reforms which could not be carried on without a wanton destruction of the foundations of society itself. He was also a Christian who planted himself on the certitudes of religious faith, and was shocked by the flippant and shallow infidelity which passed current for progress and improvement. Next to the infidel spirit which would make Christianity and a corrupted church identical, as seen in the mockeries of Voltaire, and would destroy both under the guise of hatred of superstition, he despised those sentimentalities with which Rousseau and his admirers would veil their disgusting immoralities. To him, hypocrisy and infidelity, under whatever name they were baptized by the new apostles of human rights, were mischievous and revolting. And as an experienced statesman, he held in contempt the inexperience of the revolutionary leaders and the unscrupulous means they pursued to accomplish even desirable ends. End of section 4《Section 5 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 9, European Statesmen, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Edmund Burke, Part 2. No man more than Burke admitted the necessity of even radical reforms, but he would have accomplished them without bloodshed and cruelty. He would not have removed undeniable evils by introducing still greater ones. He regarded the remedies proposed by the revolutionary quacks as worse than the disease which they professed to cure. 
no man knew better than he the corruptions of the catholic church in france and the persecuting intolerance which that church had stimulated there ever since the revocation of the edict of nantes an intolerance so cruel that to be married unless in accordance with catholic usage was to live in concubinage and to be suspected of calvinism was punishable by imprisonment or the galleys but because the established church was corrupt and intolerant he did not see the necessity for the entire and wholesale confiscation of its lands and possessions which had not been given originally by the nation but were the bequests of individuals thereby giving a vital wound to the rights of property which civilization in all countries has held sacred and inviolable burke knew that the bourbon absolute monarchy was oppressive and tyrannical extravagant and indifferent to the welfare of the people but he would not get rid of it by cutting off the head of the king especially when louis was willing to make great concessions he would have limited his power or driven him into exile as the english punished james the second he knew that the nobles abused their privileges he would have taken them away rather than attempt to annul their order and decimate them by horrid butcheries he did not deny the necessity of reforms so searching that they would be almost tantamount to revolution but he would not violate both constitutional forms and usages and every principle of justice and humanity in order to effect them to burke's mind the measures of the revolutionists were all mixed up with impieties sophistries absurdities and blasphemies to say nothing of cruelties and murders what good could grow out of such an evil tree could men who ignored all duties be the expounders of rights what structure could last when its foundation was laid on the sands of hypocrisy injustice ignorance and inexperience what sympathy could such a man as burke have for atheistic theories or a social progress which scorned only the conditions by which society can be kept together the advanced men who inaugurated the reign of terror were to him either fools or fanatics or assassins he did not object to the meeting of the states general to examine into the intolerable grievances and if necessary to strip the king of tyrannical powers for such a thing the english parliament had done but it was quite another thing for one branch of the states general to constitute itself the nation and usurp the powers and functions of the other two branches to sweep away almost in a single night the constitution of the realm to take away all the powers of the king imprison him mock him insult him and execute him and then cut off the heads of the nobles who supported him and of all the people who defended him even women themselves and convert the whole land into a pandemonium what contempt must he have had for legislators who killed their king decimated their nobles robbed their clergy swept away all social distinctions abolished the rights of religion all symbols honors and privileges all that was ancient all that was venerable all that was poetic even to abbey churches yea dug up the very bones of ancient monarchs from the consecrated vaults where they had reposed for centuries and scattered them to the wind and then amid the mad saturnalia of sacrilege barbarity and blasphemy to proclaim the reign of liberty fraternity and equality with marat for their leader and danton for their orator and robespierre for their high priest and finally to consummate the infamous farce of reform by openly setting up a wanton woman as the idol of their worship under the name of the goddess of reason but while burke saw only one side of these atrocities he did not close his eyes to the necessity for reforms had he been a frenchman he would strenuously have lifted up his voice to secure them but in a legal and constitutional manner not by violence not by disregarding the principles of justice and morality to secure a desirable end he was one of the few statesmen then living who would not do evil that good might come he was no jesuit there is a class of politicians who would have acted differently and this class in his day was made up of extreme and radical people with infidel sympathies with this class he was no favorite and never can be conservative people judge him by a higher standard they shared at the time in his sympathies and prejudices even in america the excesses of the revolution excited general abhorrence much more so in england and it was these excesses this mode of securing reform not reform itself which excited burke's detestation who can wonder at this those who accept crimes as a necessary outbreak of revolutionary passions adopt a philosophy which would veil the world with a funereal and diabolical gloom 
reformers must be taught that no reforms achieved by crime are worth the cost nor is it just to brand an illustrious man with indifference to great moral and social movements because he would wait sooner than upturn the very principles on which society is based and here is the great difficulty in estimating the character and labors of burke because he denounced the french revolution some think he was inconsistent with his early principles not at all it was the crimes and excesses of the revolution he denounced not the impulse of the french people to achieve their liberties those crimes and excesses he believed to be inconsistent with an enlightened desire for freedom but freedom itself to its utmost limit and application consistent with law and order he desired is it necessary for mankind to win its greatest boons by going through a sea of anarchies madness assassinations and massacres those who take this view of revolution it seems to me are neither wise nor learned if a king makes war on his subjects they are warranted in taking up arms in their defense even if the civil war is followed by enormities thus the american colonies took up arms against george the third but they did not begin with crimes louis the sixteenth did not take up arms against his subjects nor league against them until they had crippled and imprisoned him he made even great concessions he was willing to make still greater to save his crown but the leaders of the revolution were not content with these not even with the abolition of feudal privileges they wanted to subvert the monarchy itself to abolish the order of nobility to sweep away even the church not the catholic establishment only but the christian religion also with all the institutions which time and poetry had consecrated their new heaven and new earth was not the reign of the saints which the millenarians of cromwell's time prayed for devoutly but a sort of communistic equality where every man could do precisely as he liked take even his neighbor's property and annihilate all distinctions of society all inequities of condition a miserable fanatical dream impossible to realize under any form of government which can be conceived it was this spirit of reckless innovation promulgated by atheists and drawn logically from some principles of the social contract of which rousseau was the author which excited the ire of burke it was license and not liberty and while the bloody and irreligious excesses of the revolution called out his detestation the mistakes and incapacity of the new legislators excited his contempt he condemned a compulsory paper currency not a paper currency but a compulsory one and predicted bankruptcy he ridiculed an army without a head not the instrument of the executive but of a military democracy receiving orders from the clubs he made sport of the legislature ruled by the commune and made up not of men of experience but of adventurers stock jobbers directors of assignats trustees for the sale of church lands who took a constitution in hand as savages would a looking-glass a body made up of those courtiers who wished to cut off the head of their king of those priests who voted religion a nuisance of those lawyers who called the laws a dead letter of those philosophers who admitted to no argument but the guillotine of those sentimentalists who chanted the necessity of more blood of butchers and bakers and brewers who would exterminate the very people who bought from them and the result of all this wickedness and folly on the mind of burke was the most eloquent and masterly political treatise probably ever written a treatise in which there may be found much angry rhetoric and some unsound principles but which blazes with genius on every page which coruscates with wit irony and invective scornful and sad doubtless yet full of moral wisdom a perfect thesaurus of political truths i have no words with which to express my admiration for the wisdom and learning and literary excellence of the reflections on the french revolution as a whole so luminous in statement so accurate in the exposure of sophistries so full of inspired intuitions so christian in its tone this celebrated work was enough to make any man immortal it was written and rewritten with the most conscientious care it appeared in seventeen ninety and so great were its merits so striking and yet so profound that thirty thousand copies were sold in a few weeks it was soon translated into all the languages of europe and was in the hands of all thinking men it was hailed with especial admiration by christian and conservative classes though bitterly denounced by many intelligent people as gloomy and hostile to progress but whether liked or disliked it made a great impression and contributed to settle public opinion in reference to french affairs what can be more just and enlightened than such sentiments as these which represent the spirit of the treatise 
because liberty is to be classed among the blessings of mankind am i to felicitate a madman who has escaped from the restraints of his cell there is no qualification for government but virtue and wisdom woe be to that country that would madly reject the service of talents and virtues nothing is an adequate representation of a state that does not represent its ability as well as property men have a right to justice and the fruits of industry and the acquisitions of their parents and the improvement of their offspring to instruction in life and consolation in death but they have no right to what is unreasonable and what is not for their benefit the new professors are so taken up with rights that they have totally forgotten duties and without opening one new avenue to the understanding they have succeeded in stopping those that lead to the heart those who attempt by outrage and violence to deprive men of any advantage which they hold under the laws proclaim war against society when i ask will such truths become obsolete among enlightened people and when will they become stale but with this fierce protest against the madness and violence of the french revolution the wisdom of burke and of the english nation ended the most experienced and sagacious man of his age with all his wisdom and prescience could see only one side of the awful political hurricane which he was so eloquent in denouncing his passions and his prejudices so warped his magnificent intellect that he could not see the good which was mingled with the evil that the doctrine of equality if false when applied to the actual condition of men at their birth is yet a state to which the institutions of society tend under the influence of education and religion that the common brotherhood of man mocked by the tyrants which feudalism produced is yet to be drawn from the sermon on the mount that the blood of a plebeian carpenter is as good as that of an aristocratic captain of artillery that public burdens which bear heavily on the poor should also be shared equally by the rich that all laws should be abolished which institute unequal privileges that taxes should be paid by nobles as well as by peasants that every man should be unfettered in the choice of his calling and profession that there should be unbounded toleration of religious opinions that no one should be arbitrarily arrested and confined without trial and proof of crime that men and women with due regard to the rights of others should be permitted to marry whomsoever they please that in fact a total change in the spirit of government so imperatively needed in france was necessary these were among the great ideas which the reformers advocated but which they did not know how practically to secure on those principles of justice which they abstractly invoked ideas never afterwards lost sight of in all the changes of government and it is remarkable that the flagrant evils which the revolution so ruthlessly swept away have never since been revived and never can be revived any more than the oracles of dodona or the bulls of mediaeval rome amid the storms and the whirlwinds and the fearful convulsions and horrid anarchies and wicked passions of a great catastrophe the imperishable ideas of progress forced their way nor could burke foresee the ultimate results of the revolution any more than he would admit the truths which were overshadowed by errors and crimes nor inflamed with rage and scorn was he wise in the remedies he proposed only god can overrule the wrath of man and cause melodious birth songs to succeed the agonies of dissolution burke saw the absurdity of sophistical theories and impractical equality liberty running into license and license running into crime he saw pretensions quackeries inexperience folly and cruelty and he prophesied what their legitimate effect would be but he did not see in the revolution the pent-up indignation and despair of centuries nor did he hear the voices of hungry and oppressed millions crying to heaven for vengeance he did not recognize the chastening hand of god on tyrants and sensualists he did not see the arm of retributive justice more fearful than the daggers of roman assassins more stern than the overthrow of persian hosts more impressive than the handwriting on the wall of belshazzar's palace nor could he see how creation would succeed destruction amid the burnings of that vast funeral pyre he foresaw perhaps that anarchy would be followed by military despotism but he never anticipated a napoleon bonaparte or the military greatness of a nation so recently ground down by jacobin orators and sentimental executioners he never dreamed that out of the depths and from the clouds and amid the conflagration there would come a deliverance at least for a time in the person of a detested conqueror who would restore law develop industry secure order and infuse enthusiasm into a country so nearly ruined and make that country glorious beyond precedent 
until his mad passion for unlimited dominion should arouse insulted nations to form a coalition which even he should not be powerful enough to resist gradually hemming him round in a king hunt until they should at last confine him on a rock in the ocean to meditate and die where burke and the nation he aroused by his eloquence failed in wisdom was in opposing this revolutionary storm with bayonets had he and the leaders of his day confined themselves to rhetoric and arguments if ever so exaggerated and irritating had they allowed the french people to develop their revolution in their own way as they had the right to do then the most dreadful war of modern times which lasted twenty years would have been confined within smaller limits napoleon would have had no excuse for aggressive warfare pitt would not have died of a broken heart large standing armies the curse of europe would not have been deemed so necessary the ancient limits of france might have been maintained and a policy of development might have been inaugurated rather than a policy which led to future wars and national humiliation the gigantic struggles of napoleon began when france was attacked by foreign nations fighting for their royalties and feudalties and aiming to suppress a domestic revolution which was none of their concern and which they imperfectly understood but at this point we must stop for i tread on ground where only speculation presumes to stand the time has not come to solve such a mighty problem as the french revolution or even the career of napoleon bonaparte we can pronounce on the logical effects of right and wrong that violence leads to anarchy and anarchy to ruin but we cannot tell what would have been the destiny of france if the revolution had not produced napoleon nor what would have been the destiny of england if napoleon had not been circumvented by the powers of europe on such questions we are children the solution of them is hidden by the screens of destiny we can only speculate and since we short-sighted mortals cannot tell what will be the ultimate effect of the great agitations of society whether begun in noble aspirations or in depraved passions it is enough for us to settle down with firm convictions on what we can see that crimes under whatever name they go are eternally to be reprobated whatever may be the course they are made to take by him who rules the universe it would be difficult to single out any memorable war in this world's history which has not been ultimately overruled for the good of the world whatever its cause or character like the crusades the most unfortunate in their immediate effects of all the great wars which nations have madly waged but this only proves that god is stronger than devils and that he overrules the wrath of man it must needs be that offences come but woe to that man by whom the offence cometh there is only one standard by which to judge the actions of men there is only one rule whereby to guide nations or individuals and that is to do right to act on the principles of immutable justice now whatever were the defects in the character or philosophy of burke it cannot be denied that this was the law which he attempted to obey the rule which he taught to his generation in this light his life and labors command our admiration because he did uphold the right and condemn the wrong and was sufficiently clear-headed to see the sophistries which concealed the right and upheld the wrong that was his peculiar excellence how loftily his majestic name towers above the other statesmen of his troubled age certainly no equal to him in england has since appeared in those things which give permanent fame the man who has most nearly approached him is gladstone if the character of our own webster had been as reproachless as his intellect was luminous and comprehensive he might be named in the same category of illustrious men like the odor of sanctity which was once supposed to emanate from a catholic saint the halo of burke's imperishable glory is shed around every consecrated retreat of that land which thus far has been the bulwark of european liberty the english nation will not let him die he cannot die in the hearts and memories of any man more than can socrates or washington no nation will be long ungrateful for eminent public services even if he who rendered them was stained by grave defects for it is services which make men immortal much more will posterity reverence those benefactors whose private lives were in harmony with their principles the hales the l'hopitals the hamptons of the world to this class burke undeniably belonged all writers agree as to his purity of morals his generous charities his high social qualities his genial nature his love of simple pleasures his deep affections his reverence his christian life he was a man of sorrows it is true like most profound and contemplative natures whose labors are not fully appreciated like cicero dante and michelangelo 
he was doomed to like galileo to severe domestic misfortunes he was greatly afflicted by the death of his only son in whom his pride and hopes were bound up i am like one of those old oaks which the late hurricane has scattered about me said he i am torn up by the roots i lie prostrate on the earth and when care and disease hastened his departure from a world he adorned his body was followed to the grave by the most illustrious of the great men of the land and the whole nation mourned as for a brother or a friend but it is for his writings and published speeches that he leaves the most enduring fame and what is most valuable in his writings is his elucidation of fundamental principles in morals and philosophy and here was his power not his originality for which he was distinguished in an eminent degree not learning which amazed his auditors not sarcasm of which he was a master not wit with which he brought down the house not passion which overwhelmed even such a man as hastings not fluency with every word in the language at his command not criticism so searching that no sophistry could escape him not philosophy musical as apollo's lyre but insight into great principles the moral force of truth clearly stated and fearlessly defended this elevated him to a sphere which words and gestures and the rich music and magnetism of voice and action can never reach since it touched the heart and the reason and the conscience alike and produced convictions that nothing can stifle there were more famous and able men than he in some respects in parliament at the time fox surpassed him in debate pitt in ready replies and adaptation to the genius of the house sheridan in wit townsend in parliamentary skill mansfield in legal acumen but no one of these great men was so forcible as burke in the statement of truths which future statesmen will value and as he unfolded and applied the imperishable principles of right and wrong he seemed like an ancient sage bringing down to earth the fire of the divinities he invoked and in which he believed not to chastise and humiliate but to guide and inspire in recapitulating the services by which edmund burke will ultimately be judged i would say that he had a hand in almost every movement for which his generation is applauded he gave an impulse to almost every political discussion which afterwards resulted in beneficent reform some call him a croaker without sympathy for the ideas on which modern progress is based but he was really one of the great reformers of his day he lifted up his voice against slave trade he encouraged and lauded the labors of howard he supported the just claims of the catholics he attempted though a churchman to remove the restrictions to which dissenters were subjected he opposed the cruel laws against insolvent debtors he sought to soften the asperities of the penal code he labored to abolish the custom of enlisting soldiers for life he attempted to subvert the dangerous powers exercised by judges in criminal prosecutions for libel he sought financial reform in various departments of the state he would have abolished many useless offices in the government he fearlessly exposed the wrongs of the east india company he tried to bring to justice the greatest political criminal of the day he took the right side of american difficulties and advocated a policy which would have secured for half a century longer the allegiance of the american colonies and prevented the division of the british empire he advocated measures which saved england possibly from french subjugation he threw the rays of his genius over all political discussions and he left treatises which from his day to ours have proved a mine of political and moral wisdom for all whose aim or business it has been to study the principles of law or government these truly were services for which any country should be grateful and which should justly place edmund burke on the list of great benefactors these constitute a legacy of which all nations should be proud authorities works and correspondence of edmund burke life and times of edmund burke by mcknight the ablest and fullest yet written an historical study by morley very able lives of burke by crowley prior and Bassett, grenville papers parliamentary history the encyclopedia britannica has a full article on burke massey's history of england chatham's correspondence moore's life of sheridan also the lives of pitt and fox lord brougham's sketch of burke c w dilke's papers of a critic boswell's life of johnson the most brilliant of burke's writings reflections on the french revolution should be read by everybody end of section five